Okay, so um, our, our final speaker is um, Martin Gaynor from, uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. And Dr. Gaynor has been studying issues of market competition and healthcare uh, for, for several years and has, has made some very important contributions in, in this particular area. Uh, but, you know, it is, it is because of his expertise, he has not only given a great deal of advice on this issue here in the United States, he's actually doing a fair amount of work traveling over to London quite a bit, and he's actually had quite a say in terms of reforms that are going on now in the national health system and, and, and has helped in terms of uh, people in Britain actually taking on some of the notions of competition in U.S. healthcare and uh, incorporating them into their system. And also, if you've watched the news lately, he's also been named uh, chairman of the governing board for the Healthcare Cons uh, Cost Institute, which is actually aggregating information from all of the private insurers in the country so that we can say something about uh, something much more informative about health care costs on the private sector, um, similar to some of the data you've been seeing on Medicare today. Uh, so with that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gaynor to the podium, Healthcare Industry Consolidation, Facts, Impacts, and Policy Options. Thanks very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Oh, there you go. Um, so uh, I, was, I was sitting here this morning and I was looking at the schedule and I noticed that uh, our last speaker today after, after lunch and I kind of think, hmm, uh, I'm getting a little groggy here and people have already listed to, listened patiently to four economists. They were all fascinating and enlightening, but here I'm the fifth economist of the day about to speak. So, uh, so what can I do to maybe uh, liven things up a little bit? So I'm going to try, uh, try with a health economics joke. Now, bear in mind, uh, there, are, there are such things as economics jokes. They are out there. They're not a large number. Although, to be honest, the, uh, the set of economics jokes that are actually funny is, is not terribly large. And so uh, I was trying to think of something that, that has to do with economics and also with healthcare. So, so here, here goes. So an individual goes to their physician for their annual physical. And they have the physical and all the usual sorts of things. Physician then calls them into their office and they sit down. And the doctor says, uh, let me tell you, uh, I'm all done with the physical. I've got all the results back in. And there's some good news. And there's some bad news. The patient says, well, okay, what's the good news? The doctor says, well, this is really good. You're extraordinarily healthy in every single way except for one thing. And the patient says, well, what's the bad news? And the doctor says, well, that one thing is that you have a terminal illness and you have six months to live. Needless to say, the, the patient is quite distraught and says to the physician, well, doctor, look, um, isn't there any treatment for this illness? Isn't there anything I can do to uh, save my life or prolong my life? And the doctor says, look, I I'm sorry, but there's nothing known to medical science. And, and of course, the patient's extraordinarily upset and says, doctor, look, please, is there anything? I'll do anything, experimental treatment. I'll go to Peru. Um, I'll live underwater. I mean, any, any kind of thing that might help at all. And the doctor goes, consults a bunch of medical textbooks on the shelf, sits there, thinks, thinks, finally turns to the patient and says, well, there is one thing you can do. The patient says, oh, thank you, doctor. You're so wonderful. I appreciate it. This is wonderful. You're just the best doctor in the world. What, what is it I should do? The physician looks at the patient and says, well, you should marry an economist and move to Montana. And the patient says, doctor, excuse me, no disrespect, but how will marry an economist and move to Montana save my life? And the physician says, oh, no, it won't, but it'll make six months seem like six years. <laughs> yeah, needless to say, that may very well be what my wife feels like, but <laughs> anyhow, so uh, let me move on to the, to the talk. Uh, I did have this, this title, which, which I thought was a little bit dry. And so I, I also amended the title, How Do You Reform Healthcare with an 800-pound gorilla in the room? And uh, I think my talk actually uh, complements fairly nicely with the, with the previous talks. They've all touched on very important topics, been very enlightening. And I'm going to look at some different things. I'm going to be looking at the supply side and particularly going to be focusing on things that have to do with, with costs, although not only with costs. Let me see if I can get this thing to work. So uh, it's not news to any of, any of you here that healthcare is a very large and important industry. Let me point out just a couple things. In 2009, 
We spent uh, almost 5.5% of our national income on hospital care, 3.6% on physician services, health insurance. Uh, this is sort of net, uh, net cost of health insurance, about 1%. Um, 1980, hospital spending was about 3.5% of GDP, and you look at sort of the numbers on the slides, for physician services and for insurance, much smaller. So, so these are really big sectors of the economy, right? For, for an economist, those who took some econ classes way back when, I'm sure you love them. Uh, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands if they actually liked economics. But uh, you may have learned, learned things like about the aluminum industry or the textile industry or um, the automobile industry or, uh, or uh, energy entertainment, right? Those are all big, important industries, but they are trivially small relative to the size of these industries. Even, God forbid, brewing, beer. The beer industry, I don't know what's wrong with this country, but the beer industry is much, much smaller than either hospital services or physician services. My uh, college-age son has volunteered to do what he can to try and rectify <laughs> that situation, I guess, presumably, of course, with me paying for, for it. Uh, but that I, ap I appreciate his patriotic spirit in... Uh, in that regard. So, uh, so these are very large sectors, and notice that even a very small change, say a 1% change in the growth rate for e any of these sectors alone amounts to billions of dollars. So we're talking big money here. Uh, now, uh, a key fact, and this again is perhaps no big surprise to anybody, the U.S. depends on markets for the delivery of, uh, of health care. Uh, supply is overwhelmingly privately provided. We do have some public providers of care, say in, in uh, psychiatric care. Uh, there are still in many states uh, state, state mental hospitals for inpatient care. There's the Veterans Administration system and so on. But for the most part, regardless of where the money comes from to pay for care, whether it's for, from government or from private sources, the providers themselves are privately provided. I should say that uh, about two-thirds of all individuals in the U.S. who have health insurance have private health insurance. These are individuals as opposed to, as opposed to dollars. So there are a couple of things that are real important here. For those who have private insurance, there's a lot of people in the U.S., prices are determined in the market. They're not set by, by fiat. They're not administratively set. Of course, for those with public insurance, Medicare uh, is obviously the biggest, uh, biggest public payer. Those prices are set administratively. They're set by fiat. They are not market determined. But everything else is, is determined in the market, the quality of care, quality of service, access, any other thing that you might conceivably care about. That's all market determined. So even if you have a system where care is publicly financed, and even if prices are regulated, there are important things that markets do in those circumstances. So I'm going to contend, and I don't think this is terribly controversial, that the function of markets is a necessary condition for the successful function of the U.S. healthcare care system. That's what our system is, is based on. This isn't changed by health reform. Health reform uh, is an, uh, very nicely described uh, by, by Mark previously. Uh, in spite of all the bells and whistles and the sort of Rube Goldberg-esque quality to the health reform law, it's an incremental reform. It builds on what we have. We take private insurance markets, we subsidize people, we create exchanges. We take Medicaid, we expand Medicaid, and so on. So it therefore depends on the successful functioning of healthcare markets, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. I think this is very important. It's something that, in my opinion, has not gotten as much attention in health policy as, uh, as, as it deserves. In part, there's sort of divide between uh, policy responsibilities. The executive branch, Health and Human Services, doesn't actually have that much to do directly with markets. The other parts, uh, Federal Trade Commission, Antitrust Division, the U.S. Department of Justice, et cetera, deal with the functioning of markets, but they deal with the functioning of all kinds of markets. So that may have something to do with that. So uh, 800, there's 800-pound gorilla in the title. What's the 800-pound gorilla? Well, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is the functioning of healthcare markets, at least with regard to, uh, to cost control, uh, quality of care, any of the things that markets do for us. You're not going to get that if markets aren't functioning well. That's the 800-pound gorilla in the room. And market power on the part of providers is a serious is a serious problem. Uh, healthcare markets have become very consolidated. I'll give you some detail on that, probably more detail than you care to hear about in just a couple minutes. Increases in prices appear to be a major component of, uh, 
of increased cost. The uh, Attorney General of the State of Massachusetts, the, that office issued a couple reports on increases in costs in that state and, uh, and determined that increases in, in pro provider prices were mainly responsible for increases in costs. Some research I've done with a couple of colleagues looked at what happened to uh, prices for hospital care in California over the past decade or so, a very, very large run-up in those states. I'll show you a graph also produced by, uh, by CMS and national health expenditures that sort of breaks down increases in spending between prices and, uh, and other things. What you'll see from that graph is that prices are a large part of the picture. So any serious attempt to deal with costs or quality has to deal with this. In my opinion, uh, the health care reform law, PPAC or ACA or whatever, I'm not sure what we're supposed to call it now, uh, doesn't do this. Um, and I think in large part it is, has to do with the fact that politi the political economy is such that it was not going to be possible to pass health reform if opposed by providers, particularly doctors. Now, that's not necessarily good, bad, or indifferent, but it does have something to do with what we can expect. In my view, the main goal of the health care reform law was to expand insurance coverage. In my view, that's a very laudatory goal. Um, the other side, the cost control side, I think, was stuff put on more as an afterthought or more to uh, comply with the president's pledge that this thing be budget neutral. And, uh, and I don't personally believe that those features of the law are going to have much impact, at least in terms of reducing costs. They might have the opposite kind of impact. But even if they do, I, I don't think that they should be taken as serious attempts at, uh, at cost control. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, Massachusetts took the approach that they went with insurance coverage first. Costs have started spiraling up and up and up, and now they're, they're trying to grapple with, with costs. Uh, but that, that may be a perfectly fine way to do things. But my point is there is an 800-pound gorilla in the room that we have to deal with that health, re health reform has not done, at least not up to this point. All right, here's the, here's the graph. Pictures are always, always nice. Let's see if I can do this. So the, the, here the, the red part are the increase in spending due to, due to uh, increases in prices. This comes from the National Health Expenditures Team at uh, CMS, was uh, from an article published in Health Affairs earlier this year. And you can see in the most recent year, a little more than half of increased spending is due to increased prices. So, and over, you can see how the proportion varies over time. Over the past 10 years or so, it's been in the neighborhood of 50% with some variation up and down. So a substantial proportion, at least according to these estimates, of increased costs has to do with, with increased prices. Okay, let me just give you a very brief outline and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in. I want to tell you about uh, what's happened with regard to consolidation. I'll talk about two different kinds of consolidation, one between like kinds of firms or entities, hospitals, insurers, doctors. I'm only going to talk about those sectors. I'm not going to talk about pharma or uh, about long-term care. Those sectors have been uh, very adequately described by, by earlier uh, speakers. And then I'll talk about what economists call vertical relations, uh, uh, integration between firms of different types, hospital, physician. This is particularly hot at the moment, but also uh, insurer, provider. And then what, what's the evidence on the effects of this consolidation? As you'll hear in a minute, there has been a tremendous amount of consolidation, particularly in the hospital and also insurance sectors. What do we know about what those effects are? I'll tell you what some of the research evidence is. And, um, and then I'll talk about health care reform and, and last uh, sort of policy options more, uh, more generally. And I, I will have to warn you uh, uh, that uh, in many ways I think this talk is going to raise more questions than it, than it's an, than it answers. And uh, I guess you could say actually in some ways this talk is, is kind of like my father, my um, my dad's the kind of guy, if you ask him a question, he answers with a question. So um, when I was a teenager, you know, I'd go to my dad and say, um, uh, Dad, can I have uh, five bucks for a date? This probably tells you just how old I really am. And uh, my dad would say, you know, what, do I look like a bank? Um, or I'd say, Dad, can I have the keys to the car? And he'd say, what, do I look like I'm crazy? So, uh, so at the end, you're going to see that there are a number of questions. It's not obvious to me that there's sort of an, an easy uh, uh, policy panacea for the problems we've had, although I do think they're serious, but I'll talk about what I think some of the options are, and probably uh, there are multiple possible approaches here. Okay, so there has been 
a tremendous amount of uh, consolidation here. Uh, if we uh, look at the hospital industry, from 1994 to 2000, there were over 900 deals uh, of involving substantial exchanges of assets. If we expand that out to the present, that's around 2,000, maybe even larger. So a huge amount of consolidation in the hospital industry. I'm not familiar with Houston. I'll talk about my, my home city of Pittsburgh. I'm a fellow Pennsylvanian uh, with Mark, although we sometimes feel like Philadelphia is in a rather different state. Than, uh, than Pittsburgh, home to the Flyers and the Phillies and Eagles and sort of uh, evil sports teams like, uh, like that. Anyhow, uh, the consolidation slowed but has recently started picking up. Uh, one measure that a lot of folks use for looking at this is the uh, herfindahl hirschman Index, or HHI, that doesn't stand for Hilton Head Island. Um, and uh, that's just the sum of the squares of the market shares. It's a summary measure, and the reason you square them and add them up is it means that if you have some place where there's a, a small number of firms that have big market shares, when you square them, those things sort of get blown, the squares blow up disproportionately to just the, uh, the, the absolute amounts. And so that, make, that sort of gives more weight to that, and it makes it, it, it uh, it just reflects more uh, the, the problems that are likely to ensue from that. By 1992, if we looked on the average at metropolitan statistical areas in the United States, the HHI was about 2440, which is about like a market with four firms, independent firms, of equal size, which is fairly highly concentrated, but not extremely so. By 2006, there was almost 3300, so it's almost like you just completely subtracted one firm from that market, which is a quite a big deal. The antitrust enforcers cutoffs for considering a market highly concentrated is 2,500. So on average in the US, we were about there in 1992. And by 2006, on average, we were way, way over that. 2006, three quarters of all metropolitan statistical areas in the US for hospitals were very highly concentrated. My home city of Pittsburgh uh, you can go to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, pick any uh, any uh, location that you would like. Uh, that's that's about that's nearly about it in in Pittsburgh. They have almost three quarters of the market. They've got they've done this through acquisition after acquisition after acquisition. The only other major system left there is the Allegheny General Hospital West Penn Hospital system, uh, which has been in serious financial difficulties, so it's not even clear that system poses any substantial break on the market power of, uh, of UPMC. So, uh, so that, that is the situation in Pittsburgh, but it is not atypical. It's fairly common to see that or see one or two large or maybe three large systems, even in a very large urban area. Why do hospitals consolidate? Of course, we don't know exactly the reasons for that, but there's been research that suggests that it was the uh, rise of managed care HMOs that, that uh, provoked that leading hospitals to consolidate to try and enhance their bargaining power against HMOs, as opposed to being motivated by concerns over efficiency or enhancing quality of care. I'll tell you a little bit more about evidence on that in a couple minutes. So here's a graphic. It just shows you uh, numbers of, uh, of uh, mergers and acquisitions by year. I'll uh, skip over this. Again, if anybody's interested, they can get a copy of the slides from, uh, from the Baker Institute. Here are some, uh, some figures, again, with a little bit more detail by year about the uh, herfindahl hirschman indices. Again, I'll skip over that. I already talked about, about these numbers. This graph, I think, is, is somewhat uh, instructive. Now, I can see if I can remember, let alone read, what's what. This is, the, this is the concentration index for hospitals in the US. You can see it's going up steadily over time. These are mergers and acquisitions. What happened in 1994? Anybody remember? Clinton health reform failed. So, so absent that, this would have been a lot smoother. But there's a big spike at this point. And then the red dotted line, that's HMO penetration. So these two things are clearly moving together. Perhaps hospital deals with a lag after, after HMO uh, penetration. Again, that's not so hard scientific evidence, but it is suggestive of, uh, of the trends. Let me talk about the insurance market. Uh, here, we, we don't actually have as good data on insurance markets, unfortunately, as we have on hospital markets. But 
but there is some information, and actually there have been some researchers recently that have uh, gotten access to, uh, to some new data sets, uh, Mark Duggan and colleagues among them. So, so we do have better information now than we used to. If we look at the large employer market, and this comes from work done by, uh, by Mark and, uh, and one of his colleagues, Lee Mordofni, and a third colleague whose name I will not even attempt to begin to, Subu. <laughs> There's about an eight-syllable last name, I think. Um, I think there might even be a consonant in there somewhere. I'm not quite sure. Uh, anyhow, uh, you can see that, that these measures, by these measures, there's been a large increase in concentration in the health insurance market. Uh, after 2004 is pretty much when this happened. Uh, or it became that way after 2004, 2002 is it we, when it begins to uh, to start. This is for large um, for uh, for large large health insurers. Uh, the uh, the small group market we have some information on by a study by the uh, the GAO, the uh, Government Accountability Office, and that also shows concentration in that market and increasing concentration over time. The market share of the largest carrier in these small group markets has been increasing over time. In 2002, it was about a third, and by 2008, it was nearly 50%. Um, 87% of the states, almost all, not all, but almost all states, had five firms controlling three quarters or more of the market by 2008. In 2002, it wasn't trivial, but it was 56%. So there's been a lot going on, a lot of increase in concentration in the small group market as well. There's some other data available, but these, these two, these, I think these two uh, numbers tell the tale. The other data that are out there are pretty much consistent with this. Here's a table with more detailed information. Mark's colleague, Lee Mordofni at, uh, at Northwestern University, who is a Houston native. That's, I think, the only Houston link I'm going to have in this entire talk, uh, was generous and provided these, these data. And here's a table from the, the GAO study. Again, I'm not going to spend time on this. Uh, for, with the physician services market, we don't really know nearly as much. There are no comprehensive data nationally on what's happening in physician uh, services markets, but we do know some few things. There are some studies that have looked at what happened to practice size and practice arrangements. The Center for Studying Health System Change in Washington, D.C. has done a lot of this work. Uh, we know that the proportion of physicians in large groups has been increasing. The proportion employed has grown over time. We also know from the National Center for Health and St Statistics there's been no real increase in the number of physicians per capita uh, for quite a while. So those two things together tell us that those markets are becoming more concentrated. By the way, I mean, one thing that has a big impact on uh, the possibility of competition in physician markets, of course, is entry into the medical profession, which is, which is severely limited. Uh, approximately 50% of all applicants to med school uh, get in ever. Um, now, if we went to 51 or 52%, I really doubt we'd be letting Jethro Bodine into med school. I, I suspect the next few students who aren't getting in are, are very, very well qualified as well. That's not something that was, uh, I think, on the table at all in health room. For that, that, of course, is a third rail uh, to try and take on something like that for any, any policy. But it, it's not talked about. It's something that should be talked about. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, that. There's another piece of information here. I'll just, I'll just skip over. You can read it for yourselves. What about physician, hospital, integration, insurer, provider? There's a lot of interest in, uh, in this, in, uh, in, physician, uh, in physician hospital, as uh, particularly insurer, provider, not as much at, at present. Um, most forms of integration between physicians and hospitals peaked in the mid-1990s, PHOs, a very, very big trend peaked. I'll show you a couple graphs in a minute uh, which, which illustrate that. And then really declined sharply. There's been a tick up now. Of course, there's a lot of talk about ACOs. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a few minutes. We'll, we'll try and encourage integration. And um, there are some uh, really attractive stories you can tell, uh, uh, and I'll I'll hold off those stories uh, for, for a few minutes again about why integration would be a really good thing. Uh, so this is what we see. The only th thing at variance from this is that employment of physicians has been increasing steadily. A lot of practices have been sold to hospitals, for example. That's quite common. That's going up. There are a lot the reports, no systematic data, but reports of increased activity on this. 
So here's the graph. You can look just any one of these lines, pick one, but the red line is uh, physician hospital organizations. You can see that peaks in the 1990s and declined steadily since then, uh, ticking up a little bit uh, around uh, the middle of the, whatever this decade is called, the zeros, the double zeros, double knots. I'm not sure what to call it. And this is hospitals with insurance products, again, uh, peaking in the mid-1990s and declining steadily since then. Now, what do we know about the impacts of, uh, of, the, of this? We, I, I've just given you some information. These markets are highly concentrated, and in many cases, there are not a large number of firms to compete with each other. That has actually gotten more extreme over time. Uh, in, in many markets, the point that they're really dominated by one or a very small number of firms. And you can say, okay, well, so what, right? What does it matter? If it doesn't have an impact on things we care about, like prices, quality of care, costs, charity care, things like that, there's no real reason to care. So uh, not too surprisingly, economists have paid attention to this. There's been an awful lot of research on this, mostly on hospital markets, in part because uh, that's where the data are, right? Uh, there's an anecdote about uh, Willie Sutton, who's a famous bank robber during the Depression. They captured him. They said, well, why do you rob banks? He just looked at the person. Well, that's where the money is. So a lot of this research, not surprisingly, has been devoted to topics where data are readily available. Let me just tell you briefly about this. Again, there's more detail here than I'm, than I'm going to cover uh, at, at present. Uh, there are different kinds of studies, uh, different methodological approaches, but if you look at, uh, uh, down these bullets, what you'll see is the result is always that where there's, there are less competitors in hospital markets, prices are higher. And the methods are all slightly different depending on the exact method. They come up with different uh, estimated magnitudes for impacts. For example, the, uh, the first set of studies, what I'm calling price concentration studies, going from five firms to four firms, leads to about a 5% increase in price, which is, it's not trivial. Um, it's actually pr fairly substantial. It's certainly something that would trigger antitrust concerns, but it's not 50% increase in price. But uh, if, uh, if we look at other kinds of studies, studies which looked at the impacts of mergers that actually happened, and there have been quite a few of those in recent years, those find much larger impacts. Most of those studies find impacts in 20 and 40 percent price increases due to merger. For example, uh, Sutter Hospital in Northern California merged with Alta Bates. A study done by Steve Tan of the Federal Trade Commission found that prices, depending on who they were charging, increased to 28 to 40 percent, 4 percent as a result of that merger. So we've had about 2,000 some odd mergers from 1994 to the present. If every single one of those results in at least a 20% price increase, and many of those were consecutive because they didn't all occur at once, we're looking at pretty substantial, not pretty, very substantial price increases ongoing uh, over time. Some other kinds of studies have, have taken a little different approach. They've tried to estimate more detailed models where those demand side, the supply side, everybody comes together, has a party, there's an equilibrium, and, uh, and price is determined. Those models then use simulation to, to try and see what would happen if a merger. And some of those models, and there's a model that uh, I did with my colleague Bill Vogt, we looked at uh, a simulation of a merger in San Luis Obispo, California, that would basically have been merger to monopoly between two systems. And we found that there were very high price increases, price increases as high as 53% uh, static, statically predicted by that. One thing that hasn't been done, actually I think is an important thing to do for our future research, is not to just look at the impact of reduced competition or merger on prices in a static sense, but in a dynamic sense. What happens to price, inc excuse me, price increases over time? We don't actually know the answer to that through direct evidence. We can speculate, but we don't know the direct answer to that. Uh, now, one thing that we might think about here is, gee, uh, most hospitals in the U.S. are not-for-profit hospitals, right? They're often, and their title, have community hospitals. They're supposed to be organizations that have the benefits of the community at heart. Uh, let's, uh, did I hear somebody laughing? Um, that's not fair. Uh, it, it, it's, it's plausible that they behave in a different way from for-profit hospitals, for example, or for that matter, public hospitals, and there has been quite a bit of research devoted to examining that. So here's what people tend to find, roughly. Uh, there's not a huge difference in behavior 
If you look at pricing in terms of price levels, not-for-profits do tend to set lower prices. That's somewhat reassuring. If you look at exploitation of market power, like price increases due to merger, there's no difference between in behavior in for-profit and not-for-profit hospitals. For some other kinds of behaviors, depending on exactly what you look at, you do find differences in some cases between not-for-profit and for-profit hospitals. Mark Duggan has done some of that work. Lee Mordofni, who I mentioned earlier, has also done some of that work. What about the quality of care? Well, we care about quality of care in some, case, some ways. Maybe we care about that a lot more than we care about price, particularly if quality is, is measured by, uh, by mortality rates or differences in mortality rates. There's been a lot of work on that. Uh, what we find is where prices are regulated, it looks like hospitals in more competitive markets do better. One of the landmark studies here is studied by uh, Dan Kessler and Mark McClellan that looked at Medicare heart attack patients, and they found that Medicare heart attack patients had substantially lower probability of death if they were treated in a hospital that faced more competition than if they were treated in a hospital that did not. That work has been uh, uh, reproduced in various forms in a lot of other settings. Uh, there are a couple studies recently done in the, in the uh, UK, actually in England, excuse me, not the entire UK, the National Health Service, I did with some, with some colleagues and Zach Cooper at LSE and some colleagues did, which found very similar results in, uh, in England for the, uh, for the National Health Service. So that seems to be a pretty robust result. In the U.S., that would apply, obviously, to Medicare. What about where prices are determined in the market for the privately insured? There, the evidence is not so clear. It actually goes both one way and another. Again, a variety of studies, for example, a study looked at what happened when prices were deregulated, rate regulation was removed in the state of New Jersey and compared it to what happened in other states where there's no regulatory change, rather alarmingly, they found a substantial increase in mortality for patients in New Jersey after the end of rate regulation in their state. There are some other results that are similar to that, but then there are results that find exactly the opposite. So the evidence there is very mixed. Now, I could spend some time explaining why that is entirely consistent with economic theory, because economic theory says in markets where firms can choose both prices and quality, pretty much anything can happen. But whether it's consistent with economic theory or not, we don't, in terms of policy and thinking about what would make people better or worse off, the evidence doesn't actually provide clear guidance at this point. Cost savings, well, if you have uh, uh, firms, say, merging, say, two smaller firms becoming a larger firm, we might think there'd be cost savings from that, eliminate duplication, right? Uh, exploit scale economies, maybe even scope economies. There are lots of reasons to believe that could happen in the hospital industry. The evidence is that, for the most part, mergers don't lead to cost savings. Uh, not, again, this isn't terribly surprising, except where there's true integration. And what's happened in many cases, there's a merger of two separate hospitals, um, say uh, um, Presbyterian Hospital in, uh, in Pittsburgh and Mercy Hospital in Pittsburgh, both part of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Unless they're truly integrated, there are not going to be any cost savings. If they just merge and they have the same name on them and they coordinate their pricing and that's it, you don't get cost savings. And on, for better or for worse, that appears to be the case for most mergers that we see. We certainly don't see merger leading to price decreases. So if there were any cost decreases, which, again, research can't find, if they don't get passed on in the form of lower costs, it's not clear that there's sort of a substantial social benefit from these. Last, uh, what about charity care? An important role for, uh, for many hospitals is providing charity care. Uh, those, uh, there's an obligation uh, to some extent, certainly for not-for-profits. Evidence is that, on average, they do provide more charity care, but again, when they are facing less competition and their profits are presumably higher, they don't pass uh, the ill-gotten gains from reduced competition on to the community in the form of increased charity care. There's no evidence to indicate that these hospitals, on average, are acting like Robin Hood, which would make us at least feel a little better, even if they're charging higher prices and earning higher profits, if they're then turning around and doing something that's benefiting the community with those profits, we might feel somewhat reassured, but the research evidence does not, does not show that. Okay. <laughs> Laughing at people who aren't getting charity care. That's a tough crowd, tough crowd. 
Okay, what, what about in insurance markets? We, we don't have as much evidence for insurance markets due to lack of data, but as I said, there has been some recent research which has made use of some unique data sets. Uh, again, I referred to the, the work that, that, that Mark Duggan has done with his, his colleagues, shows that insurance premiums are, are higher in more concentrated markets where presumably insurers are facing less competition and, and, uh, and in a significant way, substantially so. There's also evidence that seems to show substantial search costs in health insurance. We find, say, in Medigap markets, evidence that even though the policies are standardized, within standardized classes in the Medigap market, you find wide differences in pricing. This shows up actually in all kinds of places. It showed up in Switzerland, where they have very standardized policies. It showed up in the Netherlands, where they have very standardized policies. So it seems to be a very consistent empirical fact with health insurance markets. There is some recent work that's shown that lots of market power on the part of sellers in the Medigap market. That market is dominated by, by two large firms, United Healthcare and Mutual of Omaha, and that evidence shows that, uh, this is by a young colleague of, of Mark's at Wharton School, the prices are marked up substantially over costs in the Medigap market. And also in Medicare Plus Choice, which is the predecessor of Medicare Advantage, there's some evidence that shows that competition in the Medicare Plus Choice market, a highly regulated market, but nonetheless, one where there's a possibility of competition actually does lead to substantially lower premiums. What about uh, physicians? I said we don't have a lot of data on physicians. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, as the stock of physicians increases, physicians tend to diffuse out to smaller towns, which is evidence consistent with there being more competition and, and yeah, people diffusing out to, uh, to uh, smaller places. There is some evidence that physician practices possess market power, although this is rather old from the 1990s. There's one recent paper that uh, for California finds a 1% increase in the physician practice Herfindahl index, which is actually quite a, uh, quite a small increase, uh, increases prices by anywhere from 1% to 4%. So a fairly small increase in market concentration of physician services market leads to a non-trivial price increase. They look at the insurer side and don't, don't find anything. So not a lot of evidence, but that's what there is. What about physician hospital integration? And here's where, here, here's where um, I think, again, there's a very appealing story to be told about integration. Amitabh referred to that briefly earlier, earlier today. So, so here's the story, right? We have our healthcare system in the US. We've got, it's, it, some describe it as very fragmented, right? So if you have a problem with a certain body part, you go here. If you have a problem with a different body part, you go here. If you require long-term care, you go here. If you have ambulatory care, you go here. So very fragmented, not a lot of coordination, but obviously what happens in the hospital can have a big impact, what happens in a long-term care facility, and vice versa, and there all these things are interconnected. So uh, it seems like there could be real efficiencies if we had more integration, certainly more coordination. Both we could have a better care and presumably lower costs, right? So, and that's a very compelling story. It is a very compelling and, and, and appealing story. It makes a whole lot of sense. Um, all this other stuff, you see the stuff in parentheses, that's economic ease for what I, what I just said. So that's all good, but what about the other side? Well, if you start integrating, some bad things can happen in principle too. So suppose uh, physician practices integrate with, uh, with a hospital, an oncology practice integrates with a hospital. Well, then that can be a barrier to competition because that oncology practice may not have an incentive to want to treat patients from other systems, other hospitals, and, or vice versa. And so, so you can have a situation where integration can actually reduce competition in the market. It can, in addition, facilitate collusion. Now, what evidence do we have? Uh, if indeed integration is reducing competition, we might think where we see it, prices would be higher. There are two studies that I know of, anyhow. Uh, one by, uh, by uh, Cuellar and Gertler finds that is indeed the case for the data they examine. Another by Silberto and Dranov finds no evidence consistent with that. So they go completely the opposite way. It's, it's not clear what to, what to conclude at this point in time. What about evidence on cost and quality? The, the, this evidence, by the way, all comes from the 1990s from physician hospital organizations. 
the evidence there, uh, there have been quite a few studies there looking at cost, quality, integration, lots of stuff like that. Uh, very little evidence of any impact in the reducing costs, enhancing quality of care, so any other thing that, that one might uh, care about. There is some evidence that integration is motivated by uh, uh, desires to enhance negotiating power and reduce competition. Uh, Bob Berenson and colleagues at Center for Studying Health System Change interviewed, I think, well over 300 people out in California about this, and they overwhelmingly said, basically, they were integrating so they could uh, enhance their negotiating position. Rob Burns and uh, colleagues, uh, a number of years prior to that, looked at physician hospital integration and found that it was very highly uh, associated with uh, with HMO presence in the market. Again, at least consistent with that same kind of interpretation. So although the, 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 the story about integration being good thing is very compelling, it really, it really is, and um, uh, I think it makes a whole lot of sense, the evidence that we have at hand is not reassuring on that. It doesn't mean that now is going to be like the 1990s, but that's the evidence we have in front of us. Let me say one thing about how pays. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, high prices. So I, I gave you evidence, I think, very compelling evidence, that certainly in hospital markets, but also what we can see in insurance markets, and we can see less in physician services markets, but there's evidence out there on that, too, that uh, these markets uh, have become less concentrated, and when that happens, prices get higher. And again, you know, you should be asking all along, so what? Who cares, right? Oh, insurance companies pay for that, right? Who cares? Insurance, big, bad insurance. Nobody likes insurance companies, right, except for those of you who are employed by them. But certainly during health reform, uh, nobody liked insurance companies. There was not a good word to be said about uh, insurance companies anywhere in the land. Uh, or maybe they don't. Maybe they raise their premiums and employers pay for it, right? So who cares, right? So, uh, so Rice University pays for uh, higher health insurance premiums and uh, everything's hunky-dory, right? Who cares about them? All I care about is myself. Well, that... That is actually not at all what, uh, what happens. Uh, the evidence, there's a, lot, a fair amount of evidence now that shows that when health benefits cost goes up, they just get passed right on to employees, that, uh, that they don't get stuck, uh, insurance companies don't get stuck with it, employers don't get stuck with it, that, uh, that workers get stuck with it. Amitab Chandra and his colleague Kate Baker have contributed to that literature. John Gruber, uh, I think Dana Goldman and some other folks have a fair number of papers that have, uh, I think, very firmly established this by now. Now, it can be that pays not what it otherwise would have been. It could be benefits get reduced, or it could be, in some cases, people lose coverage entirely. There's some fairly recent research by uh, Bob Town and colleagues that shows that, indeed, that, that does happen. If there's increased concentration in the hospital markets and prices go up, that actually the number, the rate or the number of uninsured go up in those places as well. So, so uh, basically all of us pay for this. In some cases we get less pay than we otherwise would. In some cases we get less pay in terms of total compensation because some of us lose our coverage entirely. So, uh, so it's, it's not that just some big entity that's anonymous we don't care about uh, eats it. It's, it's every one of us. Now what about lower quality? Well, it's pretty obvious lower quality directly affects folks who are our patients and their families. But if we think for a minute, it actually has larger effects than that because uh, if somebody has suffered due to lower quality of care, then um, it affects their productivity, uh, it affects uh, well-being in society, and so all of us suffer. And of course, if the lower quality of care leads to higher health care costs, suppose somebody gets low quality of care, they get readmitted to the hospital, costs go up. Again, guess who pays for that? Well. Uh, Joe Q citizen or Joe Q worker is the one that, that pays for that. So even that has not just direct impacts on the individuals involved, but social impacts as well. All right, let me say something about reform and last some thoughts on, on policy and I'll, uh, I'll wrap up. Well, uh, this is again the, the coming back to the, the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, this is a market-based system. I think I, I've, I've given you some facts to indicate that that we have some real issues with the functioning of, of markets in this, in this system. Uh, how well can reform work without market competition? Well, the insurance exchanges are set up as markets. They are indeed heavily regulated. We heard about that uh, previously. Nonetheless, if there are only a very small number of insurers that are in those exchanges, there could be real serious challenges to how well they can work. You can set 
price differences between the base plan and a more generous plan all you want, but if there's only one insurer offering plans in the market, they'll find ways to, uh, to extract higher prices from everybody. The, on the provider side, as I said, there are a number of measures there uh, that uh, uh, I think, again, I don't personally think are going to make a big difference, but in particular, if providers have market power, it's really hard to, to have an impact in a situation like that. Let me also say something about ACOs, and the, uh, there's a little tongue-in-cheek. Uh, should we think of them as anti-competitive organizations? It's an op-ed title with the body waiting to be written. Uh, ACOs are created to encourage integration, and, and I think that, that, uh, that there are smart people who have thought about this and thought about the gains that are possible from integration, just as I described, and um, it would be great if ACOs work and they achieve those gains. This, this may, may happen. It might even very well happen. Nonetheless, the evidence from the past is not very, well, uh, not very encouraging, and, and people are fond of saying, well, this time is different, but I think uh, that's a phrase I heard from my kids many times when they were, uh, they were small, and somehow this time always tended to be like the, like the last time. So I think we should have some skepticism about whether gains from integration are likely to be achieved in practice by ACOs. As I pointed out earlier, the integration can be anti-competitive. There are, are, I think there are reasons to be concerned, very concerned, that increased negotiating power is the primary motivation behind integration and that we could very well see uh, ACOs that are, that are shams, really, and that the primary purpose is to enhance bargaining power and not to uh, enhance quality of care or to, uh, or to reduce, reduce costs. So it, that's a sense in which this very well-intentioned uh, piece of the policy could conceivably backfire and actually make things worse. We don't know, of course, and I certainly hope that's not the case. I hope just the opposite occurs, but I, I, do, have, uh, I do have strong concerns about this. Okay, let me wrap up. So I just told you uh, a lot of it's a doom and gloom. Well, I am an economist, right? It's all that's the dismal science, right? We don't want to end on a happy note, do we? Um, so th these markets are very concentrated. Hospital markets in particular have gotten very concentrated. What are we going to do about it? And, and my answer here is this is sort of the question uh, with the question. I don't, I don't know for sure what we should do about it. I'm not going to pretend I do. But let me talk about a few things that we might imagine we could do. Uh, we can try and uh, be even tougher in antitrust enforcement. That's certainly a fine idea, but the resources of the agencies charged with this task are somewhat limited. Uh, they can't go around and bust up every merged entity that should be busted up. Nonetheless, if they take on some prominent examples, they may put the fear of God in others and, uh, and get them to uh, behave better even if they don't go after them. There are uh, our supply side policies. We can try and do things to try and facilitate the entry of new providers or different kind of providers, right? If we have a very consolidated market, well, if we can just get some new firms in there, that can just take care of the problem right there. Um, easier said than done. Certainly getting new hospitals into a market is not a very likely outcome. I've talked about the issue in physician services markets, insurance markets, perhaps it's... Um, it's less, uh, less forbidding a problem, but still, still not easy. Nonetheless, this is something well worth thinking about. We have seen some innovations with retail clinics coming in, especially hospitals coming in. So it's certainly possible that we can see more innovations, possibly alternative providers of medical services, such as nurse practitioners, psychologists, may be allowed to do and more and more. So there are ways that, that we can try and think about this. Demand-side policies. Uh, we, we can think about trying to resuscitate managed care or something that, that at least uh, brings the good points of managed care back. There was a time where, where nobody had a good word to say about managed care. But if we actually look at the evidence, while there were some abuses, there were actually few and far between. And managed care did some very good things, not the least of which was bringing prices down dramatically through selective contracting. Now, if you don't engage in selective contracting, if you contract with every provider in the market, you have no negotiating power, and so you can't bring prices down. And that's, that's actually, actually what happened. So, uh, so their approach is this. Amitabh told me at a break that in Massachusetts, they're thinking of trying to encourage tiered networks to try and counteract market power, some of the providers in, uh, in Massachusetts, which is a very highly concentrated market. That sort of thing, uh, I think, has a lot of potential. 
We can work on consumer information. There's been some talk about transparency. We do have to bear in mind when, when people are heavily insured, if you have, a, a, unfortunately, God forbid, a really serious health problem, you're going to go beyond your cost sharing almost immediately. And at that point, there's no reason to pay any attention to, to price differences. And we do want people to be heavily insured against really horrible events. So, so I think that while that's a fine idea, um, there may be a limit to how much we can expect from that kind of thing. We can get better information out there on quality. Again, we have to be careful there because it's not quite so straightforward to measure. Um, rate regulation, actually, uh, there was, was a time, uh, I actually remember it, when in a lot of states, uh, hospital markets in particular, were subject to rate regulation in the 70s and the 80s. Probably not here, I wouldn't imagine, but in the Northeast, it was pretty common. And there's been some discussion that maybe we need to bring that back, that these markets have gotten so consolidated that competition isn't possible. And if competition isn't possible, we don't want these monopolies simply to set prices unhindered by any, uh, any break on their market power, and so we need to regulate them. This may or may not come to pass, but there's been increasing discussions about that. And last but not least, actually, let me mention something I, I, I see happening a little bit in some places, and it's rather intriguing to me, and I'll, I'll call it community pressure. So in Pittsburgh, as I mentioned, we, we have a market dominated by a very large hospital system. And there's been a great deal of community unhappiness with the behavior of this hospital system. And a lot of discussion uh, among uh, community leaders, business leaders, unions, et cetera, about trying to bring pressure to bear on this organization to act like a community organization, or at least an entity which has community benefit as one of the things it cares about. I've heard about uh, something happening in Louisville, Kentucky that also is similar. So it, it's possible, actually, that uh, the communities organizing on their own could, uh, in the face of, of uh, very concentrated markets, bring some uh, pressure to bear on, uh, on entities and perhaps, uh, perhaps improve matters above what, uh, beyond what they otherwise would have been. Anyhow, I think those are options we're faced with. I th as I've tried to emphasize, I think this is actually an extraordinarily important health policy topic. I don't think it's been given enough attention. There were, of course, there are other very, very important policy problems in healthcare, obviously. But if we can't make markets work uh, reasonably well in the healthcare sector, then I think we're just, we're just building on a foundation of sand. Thank you very much. Marty, that was an excellent talk. Um, the the policy recommendation I, I, I consistently hear is to break down uh, state barriers to health insurance across borders. And could you comment on, on how useful you think that will be in terms of introducing more competition in the market, lowering prices? I, I think that, that that's a good idea. I can't see any strong reason not to do that. I don't know whether legislatively that's feasible because I assume that's something, a regulation that is left to the states. But in principle, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because right now, if you're an insurer, you have to have uh, underwrite state by state, have separate risk pools, which could be inefficient. And also, it could be that uh, there are some states, for example, uh, Pennsylvania is a state, where the western part of the state is dominated by a very large insurer, Highmark, which is the Blue Cross Blue Shield, the eastern part of the state, Independence Blue Cross. And if we could have insurers from Ohio or West Virginia or Maryland entering the state, then that could, could be beneficial. Thanks, Marty. That was great. Uh, <clears throat> I think you did a nice job of explaining some of the potential pitfalls with ACOs. And I think we've heard a lot of people champion that model and that we're going to you know, break, break down all this fragmentation and coordinate the system. On the on, on the other hand, you know, you, you talk about distortion of competition. Is there a way of kind of a middle ground here, or some sort of solution where we could kind of get the best of both worlds, where we might be able to enjoy some of the benefits of coordination with also thinking about you know, a model that it, that still encourages yeah, competition? Yeah, thanks, David. That, that's a great question. And to be fair, I, I didn't go into this, but it's not as if the designers of ACOs have completely ignored this. The the antitrust enforcement agencies have been involved in trying to create guidelines or safe harbors for that. I think that's in practice very difficult to do. And uh, so it's not that I, I don't think 
again, I would be thrilled if ACOs or something like that would work. But I think we do have to be concerned when, one, we haven't seen those emerge. When we've seen things that look like that emerge in the past, they don't appear to have been successful. So um, I, I think often uh, there's, there's a very strong temptation to feel like if there's a problem, we have to do something. And if there's an acronym for it, it must work. Um, Mark is familiar with this, I suppose. Uh, and so, so I, I think that uh, I, I would like to see a bit more care before, uh, before pushing those. And that's, that's done. Uh, that battle's been lost, by the way. The regs are out. Whatever's going to happen is, is, going, is going to happen. But I, I think we will have to ha pay careful attention to these as they emerge and be careful uh, because it could be that I wouldn't be the least bit surprised some will emerge that hopefully will have the best of intentions and hopefully they'll work. There will be some that are, that are built just for the purpose of being a sham. Thank you. I've enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. Uh, you were basically talking about some of the pitfalls of consolidation in the healthcare insurance industry. Um, of course, it's not quite alone. Uh, we've seen a consolidation in the, uh, we've got a handful of oil and gas companies now. We have a handful of automobile manufacturers. We have a handful of uh, uh, property insurers. We have a handful of banks. Uh, uh, we have a handful of airlines. Uh, we're, we're in a, a consolidated economy. Um, and when something happens with one of these giant, massive, consolidated entities, uh, say, for example, one of the big banks gets in trouble uh, for credit default swaps, or its insurance carrier, AIG, gets in trouble on credit default swaps, well, the government bails them out because they're too big to fail. Are we in the same situation already with health care? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, let me tell you one thing I think, think we know with regard to hospitals. Of course, hospitals for the most part are local, not national, but still we have markets that are dominated by one hospital system or maybe two. Hospitals do receive a subsidy, uh, not all hospitals, but uh, not-for-profit hospitals receive a subsidy from federal, state, and local governments uh, due to nonprofit status. They're exempt from taxation, uh, from, cor from corporate income tax, from the local property tax. And so they're already receiving an exemption. And one thing that we do see is that in areas where, say, the population has receded dramatically and there are a lot, there's a lot of excess capacity, a lot of beds in hospitals, not-for-profit hospital in particular are very slow to close compared to for-profits. Now, there's some good things about that, right? If you live in a community, and again, we, in Western Pennsylvania, of course, we see this. Uh, it's very common. Of course, steel went away many years ago, and there are many old mill towns up and down the rivers that have lost population. In some cases, those hospitals are still open when they really shouldn't be open anymore. And they are receiving a subsidy from all of us, from the taxpayers, because they're not-for-profit status. So that's not exactly the same thing. What would happen in my town with UPMC with three quarters of the market if they, God forbid, ran into horrible financial difficulty and they were thinking of closing? I don't know. Or if one of the huge national health insurance companies, Aetna, really ran into huge financial difficulty. Yeah, we may have backed ourselves in unintentionally. So I think your point is an excellent one. I actually have to confess, I didn't think about it before. But I think it only strengthens my view that, that inadvertently we sort of potentially backed ourselves into a corner here by allowing all this consolidation to occur under our noses, seemingly without paying a lot of attention to it. And now here we are. What are we going to do about it? And that's something that could make it even tougher to deal with. So let's avoid that, if at all possible.
Thanks very much, Marty. I think the issue of market concentration and how it's influencing prices was the neglected part of health care reform, in part because I think this area is extremely difficult for people, uh, non-economists, to understand. And, and I'd like to thank Marty for actually giving one of the most clearest uh, uh, descriptions and explanations for why this is an important area. So we reached the end of the conference. I'd like to thank uh, our speakers for coming today and, and doing such an excellent job. Um, and I'd like to thank our audience for coming. And, uh, and, and by all means, if you have suggestions on things that you'd like to see in future years, um, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you about, uh, about that. Uh, I hope you join us again in two, two years in 2013 when we re revisit the issue of health care reform again. A couple events coming up for 2012. Uh, I'm scheduled to talk to our associate Baker Institute roundtable members in February and give my perspective on health care reform at a breakfast talk. That, that event is uh, invitation only, but if you want to come and hear my, my side, uh, just, just email um, us at uh, healtheconomics.rice.edu uh, and, and we'll, we'll get you into that presentation. And we also have Roberta Ness, the dean of the School of Public Health, coming to speak in April. She has a new book coming out on innovations in healthcare, and she's going to be doing a book signing event at the Baker Institute. So thank you again, and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon, and, and have a good weekend. Thanks.